Well, welcome to another episode of Botany Boy. Um, today I'm going to be doing something that maybe isn't the most intelligent thing. Uh, I'm going to be uh, going up to a mountainside uh, off trail in search of uh, non chlorophyll containing or achlorophyllous uh, orchid species that uh, flower this time of year here in Japan. Um, so let's see. Uh, a couple of them you've probably seen from other videos. Um, one is uh, Certosia septen trigonalis that used to be Galeola. That's in the vanilla subfamily, so it's related to vanilla orchids. And if we get to see some flowers today, you'll see the similarity uh, between uh, those and the vanilla genus. Um, also within the vanilla subfamily is Lecanorchis japonica. This is a little tiny thing. You would you would never know looking at it that it was related to vanilla. Um, and then there's two other possibilities too. There is a strange little cymbidium species that uh, has no leaves. It's a chlorophyllus and uh, it uh, flowers around this time of year too. I've only seen it once uh, locally and that's Cymbidium macro rhizon. Uh, one other possible one is uh, Epipogium roseum. It looks very similar to uh, a Chlorolariza, the coral roots if you've ever seen those. Um, Japan is uh, home to a wide uh, range of these uh, what are technically known mycoheterotrophs. Okay, so these are plants that parasitize fungi, the uh, mycorrhizae of fungi, uh, and they actually obtain uh, their nutrients, their carbohydrate nutrient, from the, the fungus directly. So they're parasitizing these things, and they're obligate meaning they must do this in order to survive as opposed to facultative which is where you have a partial mycoheterotrophy which you see in some other genera like uh, cephalanthera for instance um, anyway we're going to be running up there looking for these plants the, the woods I'm going to are very good for this sort of a thing uh, but to be honest with you there's a good chance we're not going to see any of them and there's a reason for that and it'll probably be really the main focus of this video assuming that I make it up there I'm exhausted right now because I uh, couldn't sleep last night and had to work late for uh, work on university stuff but I'm gonna really make the effort to get up there um, it's, it's getting hot today uh, so we'll see it's gonna be a real it's gonna be a trip Anyway, uh, there are issues with this forest, and uh, rather than talk about them right now, I'll go ahead and wait, uh, and, and when we get to the mountain, I'll be talking about them specifically as we walk along. I'm going to try to do this as kind of a, a walking uh, vlog or a walking podcast type uh, video. That helps me with the editing later. I, I don't have to edit so hard. Uh, but I'll edit some interesting things in if need be. Um, so I don't know if it's going to be a real barn burner, but you're going to get a real view of what's going on in uh, forests in and around Japan and their state of being, which uh, I'm sorry to say is not the best. Uh, I don't want this video to be a downer, but at the same time I want it to reflect uh, reality as it stands. Anyway, uh, come on along and... Uh, I'll take you up to one of the local mountains here and uh, we'll see what we find. Okay, I uh, stopped here by the side of the road just to uh, give you an idea where I'm going. I'm going up into this valley here and then to the right there you will see a kind of a darker forest and also to the left but in the middle there on that top ridge you'll see that it's a brighter green forest. Okay, so now you can see very distinctly that there is the green forest to the right and below and then there is that mixed lighter green forest in the middle. That forest is a, uh, a native broadleaf forest, okay? Much of the forest in Kyushu has been cut and it's been planted in plantations 
of evergreen forest. So I'm going to talk more about that later in the history of it and what are the implications. Okay, well, we're going to try this. I got a little uh, helmet cam on. You see, I got the bike here, and I'm by this stream. This is the main drainage out of the valley, so I'm going to try going up here and see if this works. Hopefully you can hear my voice well and there won't be too much banging and clanging. This is pretty tough going in here. Uh, I'll try to keep it as steady as possible so I don't make you all seasick. Okay, so um, <clears throat> basically I'm climbing up a, uh, a drainage here. And this is not the optimal way of going up, but just going to try to give you an idea of the uh, kind of uh, forest streams we have around here. Um, <coughs> this forest here is uh, native, so it's a broadleaf evergreen forest, but as you can see there also are hinoki trees in here. That's because this entire valley in this part has been uh, made into a uh, Hinoki plantation. I'll walk up into it and you can see it. <coughs> so, basically, Hinoki forests cover much of uh, Kyushu now between two species Hinoki cypress and uh, excuse me cryptomeria japonica uh, anyway regardless in this forest there is a possibility of finding native orchids uh, these are fairly monotypic forests. there is some oh, wait a minute hold on N this is not staged I'm not kidding you here we go we've got a Certosia already in full bloom isn't this amazing? This is cool as... Oops. Oh, wow. Look. Okay, I'm going to get the other camera out. You can see him better. That's so cool. Well, there you go. Okay, in all honesty, this was not staged. Here I am, literally, just off my bicycle in a Hinoki cypress plantation. And boom, we've already found a Certosia. Um, as you can see, if you look at the uh, clusters of flowers, they're almost like little bunches of bananas. And if you've ever seen a vanilla in bloom, you'll see that it does the same thing. It's kind of like clusters of flowers and these kind of almost like banana-like umbels. Um, this is typical of, uh, well, I don't know if it's typical of the vanilla family, but it certainly is a characteristic you see in some, uh, some uh, plants. So isn't this amazing? Uh, again, this is a mycoheterotroph. That means that it gets all of its... Uh, it's an obligate microheterotroph. It gets all of its nutrient from uh, fungi that it uh, cheats out of their carbohydrates that they get in turn either from decaying matter in the forest floor and or directly from tree roots. Uh, I'm not sure what it is in this species. It varies. Anyway, amazing. Straight out of the box. Here we go, we've got a Certosia septentrigonalis, formerly known as uh, Galliola. A few things to note about the plantation fortis. You notice that um, it is the uh, same age, right? This is typical of plantation forest. They're planted just like any other planted crop. They're planted all at one time. So they're single age. and. Um, you can also see that there are hardwoods uh, establishing in here, creating more diversity. Uh, they will be cut out bit by bit um, by foresters, but more than likely they won't though for a long, long time, maybe decades, because it's uh, very labor intensive and up until recently uh, these forests really have not been economical to cut. So, what's the story behind these forests? Um, after World War II, or, or during World War II really, uh, many of the forests of Japan were cut down for the war effort. Okay, they needed it for charcoal, they needed it for timber, 
and they really went after these forests hard. And um, so what happened is that during the reconstruction after the war, uh, so that would be from uh, 1945 to 1955, that 10 year period, um, the Japanese government implemented a program where it was uh, reforesting the land. And uh, the problem is, during that time, they also cut down many, many native forests in order to create more of these plantation forests, because at the time, uh, cedar and uh, cypress were uh, coveted woods. And um, they planted them like crazy. So actually what ended up happening is that even the native forest that had made it through the devastation of that period uh, were lost. And so that's why we have so many of these forests today. Something in the order of uh, 50 to 60 percent of Kyushu's forests now are actually in this forest type. Uh, I don't even know if you can quite call it a forest. Anyway, this is the situation today. Okay, um, well, as you can see, I'm uh, still climbing up along the stream valley here. And you can see it's really a, it's a picturesque little place, you know. You can only imagine what this place was like in the past when these forests were, uh, you know, truly primeval. All over there you can see the Hinoki very distinctly. Then as you move over here you can see the more native forests, right? And then of course the stream itself. Uh, the chances of actually seeing anything of interest in, uh, along the stream here are kind of remote. I've been along these streams many times and they're, uh, they're pretty, but they don't really uh, tend to yield many botanical wonders. Sometimes you'll see uh, some pretty cool ferns, but um, as we go up the mountain here, you're also going to see that uh, there's going to be an effect of something else and it'll be very clear and uh, I'll show it to you once we get there. I'm already kind of catching signs of it now. Later it'll become more and more apparent. Okay, um, so here I am along this uh, beautiful scenic little valley here. Looks very idyllic. But we're coming up to something that's of uh, very great interest historically. And uh, actually, it's a fact lives up even till these days. And it is this thing right here, this seeming pile of rocks. Well, this pile of rocks obviously is not a natural phenomenon. This is, in fact a pit that was created by men. Uh, gosh, I don't really know how old these are. They could be almost any age. Charcoaling has been an important uh, industry in Japan's history, as it has been in many parts of the world. And uh, Japan's forests have uh, gone through a series of ups and down cycles. So, you know, say 300 years ago, during the Edo Jidai, or Edo period, forests were being indiscriminately cut for timber and charcoaling and whatever else. And then attempts were made by the government to stop that trend. And that started to happen. They were taking care of business. But then, uh, Things got slack again, and then when the Meiji period came in the late 1800s, um, the government felt that it was necessary to uh, go after forests again uh, for the purposes of modernization. And once again, um, there was a great deal of destruction. And, uh, well, that was a serious problem. So that by like 1870, they 
enacted new laws and uh, again protecting the forest. Uh, here you can see me actually in the charcoal pit itself uh, walking around looking at it. Obviously right in here is where they would stack all the wood and then they would cover it up and they would let it smolder and form charcoal. Well what is the significance of this? Obviously the original forest here is gone and now we have this Hinoki plantation. Now exactly what came very likely, well there's no doubt about it, the charcoaling came first. Okay, And um, very likely though the forests were badly hurt at that time they may not have been completely diminished or you know denuded and um, then uh, through time uh, the forest would grow back uh, species composition definitely has changed um, I know locally probably uh, the chinkapins, that's the uh, Castanopsis species, are uh, Cuspidata being the main one there, I think. And then there's another one, Sibuldiana, or maybe that's a variety of Cuspidata. Anyway, um, they became more uh, prevalent. So, definitely species composition change. But then this forest was completely transformed into this, uh, you know, this monoculture of... Uh, Camisipris, obtusa, the uh, Hinoki cypress. So anyway, uh, thought I'd show you that those um, little uh, charcoaling, whatever you want to call them, pits, are all over these woods, and uh, they show the history of this place, and they also show, uh, they also affect the quality of what remains here in terms of the natural resources. And you're going to see that further up the mountain when we get into some of those charcoal pits where there's still native forest left. But that's later. We'll get there, I promise. Breathe a little heavy now. Here we go. Okay, well here we're a little further up. I just came across a little forest road. And um, <clears throat> here you can see uh, some of the forestry I was talking about. What they've done here is they've thinned out some of the trees because of course when they plant a plantation forest they always overplant, and uh, that means somewhere down the road they could have come in and uh, thin out the trees so that they can get good growth on the other trees. And again as you can see the trees are all very even aged, all very straight bold uh, typical plantation forest. You can also see that um, the cutting of the forest has created a lot of openings which in fact creates uh, greater opportunities for diversity and so that is good and what is lacking in many of these plantation forests today is that they were so mass planted after the war uh, meaning World War II that they could not be properly managed and um, so diversity has dropped radically in many of these forests because they're just too dark and they don't support a lot of vegetation under there under the canopy and the trees themselves are not healthy and that creates this kind of a double whammy uh, it's no good for the wildlife certainly no good for the plant communities um, and this is the state of much of the forest in Japan today. So this little tiny piece here, this example, is actually, in a way, much better than just having a uh, unmanaged forest. And here, I'm going to go ahead and walk over here, and you can see the incredible difference when we cross over this little... Uh, well, let's see if I can cross. I don't know if I can, I can at least show you. Yeah, it's pretty tight. I'm going to have to go down there. I'm going to go across here. Uh, but anyway, up in there is the native forest. And so let's go up in there and see what that's all about. What's going on in there? Uh, here I am, my little old road here that was made into the forest years ago and uh, this is the um, 
This is the native forest of Kyushu here. Okay, so we're looking at a lot of broadleafed, uh, largely evergreen forest. Some deciduous species in there. In other words, they lose their leaves annually <coughs> in the winter time. Um, but uh, one thing you'll notice immediately, and this forest isn't even that bad, is that it's a whole lot darker in here, and uh, that automatically. Uh, puts a, a stopper on a lot of uh, things growing in the leaf litter. Now you'll notice there is a little seedling here that looks like maybe, a, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, it's really hard to identify a lot of these guys, particularly when they're young. I'm going to possibly call that a Photinia, but it also could be a species of oak. Uh, here's a, uh, that's definitely Neolitzia, Ceresa. Uh, well, well, another thing you can notice here is that there's not a whole lot going on in the understory, although I've, I'm talking here and boom, right away, what do I see? Here is another orchid. This is uh, Cephalanthera species, probably Erecta. I showed you some of those earlier, I believe, in the year. Um, growing near my house. Another mycoheterotroph, though not an obligate one. It has a very tight relationship with fungi, but uh, it obviously, being green, can also photosynthesize. Well, anyway, you can see that, again, there's relatively little... Uh, things growing in the understory here. And it isn't just because there's, there's a waterway here. You look up on the hillsides there, you don't see much. And I remember the first time I came in this forest, I was like, huh, it's pretty, but what the heck's going on here? There's nothing growing here. And uh, when we get up top uh, and we get into more flat areas on the flat ridge lines, you're gonna probably see even more of that effect. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit then about what that's all about. What hits you about this forest? So something about it isn't quite healthy. You know, something's a little amiss. And uh, this place should just be brimming with all kinds of uh, plants. Ferns, for sure. And, uh, you know, I don't think I've seen a fern. I mean, not one. And, you know, pretty much every forest that I travel in around here, there's ferns, you know. I mean, look at this. The leaf litter is just that, leaf litter. Occasionally you see a little tree seedling that's trying to do something. But it just doesn't seem to get any bigger than about, uh, I don't know, hand high. Something like that. Uh, well... The long and the short of it is, the revelation, is this is due to intense herbivory by the uh, native Sika deer. Okay. This, uh, this deer is a native species, but its populations are out of control throughout much of Japan. And actually, Fukuoka area is not even considered to be a place that's uh, of special concern. In Kyushu, uh, further south, central Kyushu, the deer populations are expanding more than here. So, uh, if this isn't too bad, I can't imagine what's happening in places like uh, southern Kumamoto Prefecture and parts of northern Miyazaki, I hear, are uh, really getting horrible now and uh, trying to control these guys uh, has been a real issue. And of course the question is why? Well, okay, here I am uh, taking a break this very extreme hillside. Uh, it's quite a climb up here. And uh, here you can see the canopy of the forest, as I said. Broadleaf, 
largely evergreen, not only evergreen. That's a nice butterfly. Um, <clears throat> I just scared up a boar. Yeah, there's a wild boar. It's it's Suscrofa, just like uh, you find throughout much of the old world. Uh, yeah, he scared me, and I scared him about equal. <laughs> um, yeah, wild boar are another creature that lives around here, and uh, they uh, they do their share of damage as well, but uh, what they do is kind of natural. What the deer are doing is another thing. Um, and again, when we get to the top and I get out all this gnarly stuff and I can actually start walking easier, I will show the effects of the deer. I'll show you very specific examples of how they are affecting uh, this environment. Anyway, uh, bugs seem to be backing off a little bit. Haven't seen any orchids. Keep an eye open for them, but uh, I don't know. I'm not sure where I'm going to find those. I'm going to have to find a place where there's more cover than this. I think pretty much anything that grows here doesn't get to live very long. It gets eaten pretty quick. Everything is just bit back here. Okay. Up we go. Okay, so I'm uh, finally up on the ridge here, a little spur ridge that's taking me up to the uh, main ridge line. Um, wasn't this interesting? This is a uh, this is a cherry, and you can see that it's growing all these adventitious roots down here, and I don't know why it's doing that. It's interesting. But also notice, look at that. Little growth, they're growing, looks maybe, I don't know, maybe some kind of a cancerous growth on this thing. But see, nibbled off. They're all nibbled off. Well, doesn't that tell you something? It tells you that our friends, the deer, are very, very active in this forest. And you're gonna see a lot of that coming up. Uh, another, not to, uh, overburden the point but um, on this side Hinoki plantation and some sugi in there too some uh, cryptomeria as well other side native forest so uh, this little ridge line is where they decided to demarcate the boundary um, Again, still more, no native uh, orchids or anything of interest really uh, in terms of things growing. Uh, in terms of things being eaten, like here, let's go ahead and just come down here and take a look at this little guy, see if I can get this where you can see it. Okay, I think that's showing it now. If you look there, you'll see that this little plant has been chewed and rechewed and chewed over again. Um, I'll show more examples of, of that as I go along. Uh, nothing can grow here for very long before it is ruthlessly eaten back. And uh, I'll show some really powerful examples when I get up top because there's a couple places where I've seen fern species that nothing should really bother them. Nothing I've ever seen on any mountain. Even the other mountains that have be, uh, uh, deer on them. I've never seen the kind of destruction that I've seen on this mountain or this mountain ridge. This place is exceptional. Uh, years ago, I used to work uh, uh, for a professor at Kyushu University, top university here in Kyushu, and they have a research forest right in my town, as luck would have it, and I did an Ikaiwa class for him for a few years, and, uh, you know, we talked about it a lot, and he said, uh, you know, they 
lands that they had over here that they're trying to do um, research on. They couldn't even do their research because the uh, deer were getting in and eating everything up, uh, messing up their experiments all the time. So they actually had to, uh, you know, create enclosures just for their experiments. Pretty crazy. <clears throat> well, I've just stopped here for a break. Uh, and I'm sitting in this, uh, well, really lovely looking uh, forest of uh, hinoki trees that have been thinned, looks like some time ago. And uh, here you're beginning to see some more growth. There's more opportunity for things to grow over here than over on the other side over there is where the native forest is and it's that dark dank forest that is just uh you know really does look like murkwood or something but here's the thing i'm seeing ferns and some other plants over here toad lilies and whatnot little tree seedlings but if you look closely over here you'll see that everything here as well is nipped down um the deer are very busy on this ridge line uh, and these forests in general. Um, a little bit further down the ridge line here, there's the peak, uh, which is around uh, 650 meters. So a little over 2,000 feet, right? Um, and uh, there used to be about, oh my gosh, certainly 10 years ago, and earlier than that, definitely, uh, there was all kinds of different uh, interesting plants over there, including like five different orchid species, one of which I'd never seen anywhere else in the area. Uh, yeah, lots of Calanthe, and there was uh, at least one species of Leparis, two different Gudiras, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. You go over there now, everything's gone. There isn't an orchid to be seen anywhere. It's all eaten down. Um, so this area has been impacted uh, just in a very short while. And uh, <clears throat> it just kind of makes you wonder, what was here, you know, before all of this came down? Uh, it's a serious matter. And uh, honestly, I, I wish I could show you more orchids. I'm, I might actually spend a little time around areas like this that seem to have more going for them, like that first area where I saw the uh, Certosia. That looks like it's going to give me better uh, better opportunities than uh, <clears throat> the other side. But I am going to take you to the other side too, and I think I'm going to I'm going to end the video there because it's getting late. I got to get home, and uh, I'm tired. <laughs> It's pretty good climb up here. You know, you don't have uh, any trail for the first, uh, you know, 500 meters straight up and you're just coming up through that crazy rocky forest. It's quite a, your heart's in your throat the whole time. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I do have to get back and uh, I wanna do maybe one more clip, unless of course I find something really cool, in which case I will let you know. And uh, yeah, and I'll stop and, and take a video of that. Uh, there's there's possibility. There's still a possibility, so don't give up hope. And uh, anyway, so this is pretty much what I expected. Okay, it's uh, <clears throat> getting kind of late in the day here, so uh, running out of light. But I wanted to show you this little valley in here. This place really is magical, and it makes you wonder just what the heck was this place like you know say i don't know 20 30 years ago uh, this is a little natural valley uh that is it shows all the signs of being a really biologically rich area but once again except for a few plants uh, you'll see that the ground is heavily trodden here. Um, there's all kinds of sign of uh, animal activity. Probably both Inoshishi and the, uh, the deer. Up oh, here's another uh, one of those charcoal pits too. 
lovely, you know, lovely place, but uh, again, something is a little amiss. All around is deer sign. I've scared up at least two groups of them already, and they have really tussled up the ground everywhere around here. Uh, really a, a bizarre experience coming here, almost kind of a otherworldly. So let's cross this little creek without killing ourselves, and uh, we'll continue up into this strangely beautiful and yet uh, obviously uh, ailing ecosystem. And here, this area here should be just swamped with ferns. And you can see there's a few. And it looks like a little uh, polystichum species. Yeah, there's a polystichum, uh, not polybulferum, it's the other one. Trypteron, I believe. Um, yeah, just weird. You know, really weird. So let's go ahead and uh, walk up here. Beautiful. I mean, it's really a magical place. You can imagine that this place was just stuffed to the gills with all kinds of spring ephemeral flowers. And there's a couple little things growing in here, but look at the ground over there. It's barren, you know. They obviously bed down in here a lot. I see their hoof prints everywhere. Remarkably, not too much poop. You would think you'd see more of that. Um, but their sign is everywhere. Look at the ground, man. Denuded. It's just literally denuded of anything. Lovely little creek beds. Again, should just be stuffed to the gills with all kinds of stuff. Nothing. So I'm going to finish today's video here at this little uh, charcoal pit in this uh, enchanted, uh, I call it the ghost forest, because that's how I feel. Feels like there's a lot of ghosts here. Um, a couple of positive notes here is along these stream beds I've been finding large uh, colonies of uh, Sinalesis uh, palmata composite that lives in these forests and uh, it's growing up along in these <coughs> wet areas, these little islands and uh, also down actually in these little uh, swampy areas in between uh, the, these little islands that are out on these little creek beds that are all running through here. Uh, there also right here is a little uh, Cornus Culsa in full bloom. It's such a lovely tree. I mean, uh, so radically different than the North American uh, Cornus Florida. Uh, it, it blooms so late. I mean, here we are almost in July and it's in full lovely bloom. This forest is gorgeous. You know, I've sat here for about 10 minutes as being quiet and... Uh, I can hear all around me in the woods. I hear snorts and little grunts and kind of movement. And uh, this place is just burgeoning with deer and probably the Inoshishi, the wild boar as well. If you put out a little trail cam, I'm sure it'd just be continuous footage of animals going by. Uh, one wonders what the heck they're eating because they really is, they have eaten this place to a nub. Uh, I guess the Sinalesis must be a, um, a poisonous plant. I'll have to look that up. I didn't even think about that because they're not touching that. But boy, they've eaten everything else down to the, to the floor, including all the ferns and all of the uh, broadleafed evergreen that they can reach. Uh, it's really peculiar. So anyway, uh, I came to this place to find uh, the ghosts that live in the forest, all the microheterotrophic orchids. Found one, 
right out of the box. I knew that was bad. I knew that was like, oh, here we go. That's the only one I'm going to find. And uh, maybe that's it. Yeah, There's a possibility that I will wander against one here and hopefully we'll have a little light to shoot it if I do. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to have to leave you with that. And I'm, I'm sorry that it wasn't a, a more riveting um, video today, but hopefully you learned a little something about the uh, the status of the uh, forests here in uh, in Japan. And uh, this is a nationwide issue. Um, Fukuoka is, I don't think, in any way extraordinary. It's been settled for quite a while. That makes it different. But um, most of Japan's been settled for quite a while, except for Hokkaido and some other highly mountainous areas. Um, yeah, forests have been converted into plantation forests, which is good and bad, right? So there is biodiversity in there, but it's also been reduced. And then these native forests are just in precarious shape. So uh, hopefully there are more who are taking care of these things. I mean, I, I, I've seen quite a bit about uh, the way some townships are handling it. I don't know what they're doing here. Doesn't look like much. Uh, they're trapping them. <clears throat> God knows what they do with them after they trap them. And you can't just release them somewhere else. What, are you going to domesticate them and kill them? I don't know. Uh, and uh, hunting is, of course, uh, a very expensive and difficult hobby here in Japan. So very few people do it. And most people are urbanites. They don't care to get out on the woods and deal with all the bugs and everything. Um, there are no native predators that are still running around. Wolves are all gone and all that. And everything is kind of out of whack. And all the, uh, the good uh, lands down in the valleys are dominated by humans. So, uh, where do the animals go? They have no place but to come to these forests. So, uh, that's what's happening. Degraded forests across the boards. Some well-managed forests, but uh, quite a bit in this kind of... Uh, ambiguous state and going forward a hundred years from now things stay the way they are it's not going to get better it might get uh, disastrously bad it's already that way for some species of uh, wild plants but even the forest here without seedlings being recruited onto the forest floor and creating new a new canopy What's going to replace these trees when they die? Because they're going to die. Everything dies. Anyway, I uh, hope there wasn't too much of a bummer. I hope it was an education. And you got to see some kind of cool forest, hopefully. And I hope the sound came out okay in this, too. Because this is the first time I walked around bouncing around like that. Anyway, i got to get back uh, to the hacienda before it gets too dark here. I've got a lot of... Nasty woods walking to get off this ridge line again, and I'm not looking forward to that. Probably running into Inushishi and all kinds of stuff on the way down, too. And then I gotta go find my bike <laughs> before it gets dark. <laughs> all right, well, uh, thanks for watching today's video, and I'll see you next time. Well, uh, I can't do uh, this justice with the light and actually it's not in bloom yet but here we have a large large colony of Certosia growing you can see we got one two three four five six seven eight nine nine stems that's as bad as good as I've ever seen um, they should be going off in about another week I would say it's almost worth hauling my butt back up here again next week or a little thereafter to see how they're doing. Knew there was a chance to see them again, so the ghosts are still here in spite of the deer. Uh, they live on. And uh, who knows? Uh, I'm sure if I spent more time running around here, I'd find even more. Uh, well, I mean, I'm glad it ended this way. That's a good omen, right? It's really cool to see this. Anyway, here you go. One of the uh, great... Uh, Mycoheterotrophs of uh, Japan's southern forests.